it is your buddy peace and harmony with you here today much love going out to all the beautiful empowered harmonizers and we're zooming in and focusing in a little bit more in depth in terms of understanding the connection and the correlation between a narcissist behavior and shaming really sort of con condescending behavior manipulation to disempower you, especially as it relates to a sense of grandiosity or entitlement. And that's part of their personality disorder. But before we get started, I want to give a huge shout out to those of you who have recently donated to the channel. We have Michigan in the house. Whoop, whoop. Love Michigan. It's a beautiful, gorgeous, uh, very fertile, uh, productive area of the United States. So many lakes, waterways. Um, different orchards. It's just a really beautiful place. So welcome. It's an honor and a privilege to have you in the house, Michigan. And also, I want to give a huge shout out to Egypt. We have Egypt in the house. So cool. What an honor and a privilege it is to be reaching all the way internationally from the United States to Egypt and be able to hit home and discuss some very confusing, bewildering, and painful relationship dynamics that oftentimes we don't have the resources to sort through, make sense of, and then work productively through. So thank you so much for reaching out and sharing, and great to hear from you. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to set forth on this journey here together and embrace and hold hands through this to make sense. There's not enough information in the healthcare field, certainly in the United States, as well as I can imagine in other um, in other countries, Egypt, Canada, Australia, Germany, um, France, you know, there's not enough information, experiments, resources, or easy to access data to help you understand and make sense what's going on. And rather than living a life in suffering and pain and confusion and feeling disempowered, negated, and really understanding what these states of being are, and, you know, rather than, you know, Oftentimes ascribing it to, you know, there's something wrong with me. Um, I just don't feel good. I don't feel comfortable. Um, this doesn't seem right, but I don't have any other connections to validate this with or to talk to. And people say, just deal with it. Just, you know, swallow it. Um, you know, people don't understand. It's not an acceptable, tolerable place in life to go through, psych you know, psychological abuse emotional abuse through relationships with those personality disordered individuals such as the narcissist or the psychopath. So we're going to zoom in and focus in a little bit more in depth in terms of understanding the connection, the correlation between the narcissist and their behaviors, particularly that of grandiosity, entitlement, and how they are then making others smaller, minuscule, minimizing them to the point where they are feeling rendered disempowered. And it is to understand that disempowered state basically means where you're not able to live and embrace your truth, your perceptions, your knowledge, and being able to have that validated. And then without that ability or experience, your neurology will begin to extinguish itself. The, the neurons in the, that wire and fire together, the synapses that are created, aren't able to grow and really get in a foothold, get in their roots within your neurology, your neurophysiology, and your hormones, your neurohormones. And so without this experience of being able to validate it, these, these connections within the mind, and, and then in the, which then flows to your body, the subconscious mind, your emotions, aren't able to really begin to proliferate and grow strong. And you don't have that sense of, positive self-validation or positive picture of self because this the feedback from these negative others who basically just want to take others down it's as if their happiness threatens them because their happiness is a sense that you know they are secure they are living you know they have a truth or they're calling certain things out that they are finding unacceptable and the narcissist finds this threatening it is their insecurity which you are then rendered down several rungs to. So it is they're always wanting to take others down um, and begin to use the tools of projection, 
which of course then leads to the gaslighting and brainwashing. It is like planting the seeds of doubt within you, planting the seeds of despair within you, planting the seeds of uh, lack of positive self-regard. Um, so it's planting the seeds so that these negative feelings, things, behaviors, and experiences, and then self-identification begin to grow it is very, very much like a garden. Um, the shaming that can occur. So they are like negative verbal commands. Um, you know, what is wrong with you? It is insinuating there's something wrong and inherently flawed with you. So these chronically repeated over time begin to, you know, take root within you, even though they are nothing but a manipulation tool that are, is designed to render you helpless, the body tends to, without, you know, knowledge and experience or a solid foundation, it takes this at face value and the subconscious mind will follow commands, whether they're positive or negative. So if you give your subconscious mind the command to be unhappy, be miserable, um, be a failure and live up to these commands, see the worst in things, look on the dark side, look on the bleak side, feel unhappy. If you give yourself commands like this, even if they're coming from a quote unquote position of authority or a narcissist, someone who unequivocally wants to have authority, control, and power over others because this is how they operate. This is how they get by in life. It is, it is these tactics with which they use to feel better about themselves. So rather than feeling good about themselves in a humble, authentic way, they need to draw this experience or feeling from basically have a dominating sense over others. So this is how it's like whose toes can they step on, um, whose you know, uh, grimace can they make, they have a sense of control or power. And usually those people who have empathy are not able to really get that. They, they're not coming from the same place. They're not coming from this need. They just want to have a functional relationship. They just want to have fun. They want to be happy. They want to be heard. They want to listen. They want things in this balanced order, but very quickly, the scales will get to, you know, become very, very tipped. Um, it will become very, very discordant. And so the, the target, the supply doesn't know different than to just accept this at face value. And oftentimes there's been a relationship of dependency created where then you've relegated or given into this person and assigned them you know, a, a position of superiority or that they have a talent that is outshining of yours so that you don't even own your own brilliance, you don't own your own talents, you don't own your own strengths, that, but that you over idealize them and put them on a pedestal because you've bought into their, um, their uh, diatribe that they are the talented, they're the smart, they're the one with the money, they're the male, they're the female, they're the good looking one, they're the smart one, whatever it is that they have, you know, um, you know, that they have expounded or explained about themselves as part of their narcissistic personality, you know, they're coming from this place. So you must, you know, you are obliged to treat them as such. So it becomes kind of a, a wearing together, like two rough edges, you know, wearing over, you know, and they grind your edge down. They grind your brilliance down. They, they grind your own talent. So you don't get a chance to express these. And so the shame that is felt then becomes the disempowered state. It becomes the, I am not brilliant state. I am not magnificent. I am not good enough. I am not good looking. You know, I am not. So you're defining yourself by your, your not. So you're defining yourself and then by this negativity and then it becomes quite toxic. And then you're living by what we call a lack mentality. I have not. And so as you continue to focus on this, then that experience grows. And then you're giving your body the subconscious mind to fulfill this. This is known in psychology as the self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I can't handle, um, you know, fa finances on my own. I can't um, make my own money. I can't be happy um, independently. Um, I'm, you know, and so all these then behaviors then follow up. And then the body is then going to look you know, it's just, it's a, it's a universal law. It's going to look for experiences, reasonings, and other validation to accumulate on this same, 
on the same emotion. So you can then, people then spend weeks, months, years, decades, or oftentimes their entire life in this disempowered state. And they're wondering, you know, life doesn't have it for me. I missed my boat. It's too late for me. Life is for people on that side of the tracks. Um, life is for people who are, you know, this tall, this skinny, this fat, you know, whatever, whatever. You, you know, then explain and justify that life doesn't hold opportunities for you. And then you, you begin to hold distrust and, you know, things just seem to, you know, get very, very, um, very str much a struggle. Um, life doesn't become easy. Life doesn't come pleasant. Life doesn't become happy. It becomes a struggle. It becomes angry. It becomes all these negative disempowered states, the apathy, shame, uh, depression, the anxieties. And then, you know, the neurochemistry then is beginning to build up. And so that's why I talk about the seriousness of it, because when, especially when this is done early in life, a really interesting, um, information um, on the Joe Rogan podcast. Um, he had a, a guest speaker and I think her name is Dr. Uh, Dr. Rhonda Walker. Uh, I'll have to get the name, um, but she is a scientist and she very much looks into the, the, um, the epigenetics, especially, you know, in other words, how your DNA is affected and then reproduces as a result of early trauma or, um, you know, the other, um, chemical and real physiological scientific aspects of this. And she had cited a very interesting, uh, uh, study that was done in mice. And oftentimes a lot of the studies are done in, in mice or, um, you know, other, um, animals that, you know, then, so they can understand the studies of how the brain and the neurochemistry and the neurohormones work. And she described that, um, which is a similar comparison, is that in mice, so in mice that um, they looked at a study where there was those babies, their pups, which were nurtured, you know, licked, coddled, kept warm, you know, that's what a nurturing mother will do to a baby mice. It'll lick it, it'll cuddle it, it'll keep it warm. And they found that those, um, you know, that those uh, mice who did that then developed a higher um, um, oxytocin or bonding connection with those mice. And then they were also, those mice then grew up to be happy and then uh, basically uh, monogamous. In other words, they wouldn't mate with like multiple mice. They had a balance of oxytocin and they were able to create bonding, healthy relationships. They wouldn't be all over the place and chaotic. Now they also found that mice who were not licked, their pups were not licked, they were not nurtured. Um, these uh, pups uh, basically also had a lower incidence of oxytocin and were not able to uh, be able to bond and connect with others. So that was actually passed on genetically, um, you know, into that mice and then onto their offspring. Um, I think their lifespan is like only a couple months, but furthermore, um, and so this lack of oxytocin, so in other words, if you didn't have a lot of that positive validation, if you had this, you know, narcissistic relationship shaming early on in life, then oftentimes you didn't get a chance to build up healthy levels of serotonin, the feel good chemical or oxytocin, which is that feel good bonding chemical, which you feel, which is released when you're in healthy relationships. It's just a feeling of well being, security. I can trust this person. I am safe. I am loved. I am loving and I can love and I love this person. So that's like just part of the bonding process. When you think about people who you've bonded with in a healthy manner, or some people are like, what healthy manner? So you can see how important oxytocin is towards, you know, a bonding, you know, close, healthy relationship. Now, interestingly enough, um, those pups who did not have the healthy oxytocin, especially in the females, there was more receptors created. So in other words, there, there wasn't an uptake. So they created like an excess of these receptors. And, um, and then, so serotonin was also, um, you know, lacking. And so they found that then these mice would be more promiscuous. In other words, these mice who didn't have the bonding, they would go and then, you know, not only mate with one, like most healthy mice, they would mate and then have a litter or whatever you call the pups 
and then they would mate again and again and again. So they became like promiscuous mice. So, you know, just like we see the, um, you know, the promiscuous in those people who have been abused or have been shamed, they tend to have a high propensity to turn to, or that, that estrogen is uh, basically in higher amounts, especially in female. And I'll get, <clears throat> I'll get back to you, um, in another session. So we don't go too long in terms of how it affected the males. <clears throat> but it, it is to understand then that there was more receptors for the ex estrogen. And so it created this sort of promiscuity or feeling like one can give oneself away sexually, or that was needed in order to connect and be and create sort of a relationship even though it's very unhealthy you can also i'm sure you've seen either within yourselves or others those people who have had abusive backgrounds um where they have been neglected um hyper criticized um <clears throat> not had a chance to bond others with others <clears throat> in this healthy manner that oftentimes this leads to the promiscuity um, and then the disloyalty, the dysfunctionality, so they have relationship problems. So you can see there's a very, very strong, and what I feel is a very serious correlation. So you need to look back into yourself because this channel is all about healing you. You know, you can um, focus on the wrongs that were done, and but understand what it is. But if you focus on that, the, the more you focus on that, the more it's going to grow and take up too much space in your life. So need to kind of kick a lot of those bad feelings to the curb and you need to give more space within yourself in terms of unconditional positive self-regard so you can see your magnificence so you can see your strength you can see your humanity you can see your heart you can see your your strengths and your good deeds and not as it's validated by a you know a pathological individual because if you keep turning to the pathological you're just going to get more of the disease, the disordered, the suffering. So you actually unequivocally have to turn away physically, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually away from them on all levels. So that means not to hold them in mind because holding them in mind is keeping that whole reticular activating system going. So your reticular activating system is, it, it tells you what to attend to in your environment. So if you say, look for something red, you know, you're going to look around at everything red. And then if you say, if I were to say to you right now, you know, take um, 15 seconds and scan the room and find something that's red. You could probably, you know, find 10 or 15 things. And then if I were to, then if you were to then look at your environment once again, you would all of a sudden continue to notice those red things. So you're, you're giving yourself this command to focus on the shame, focus on the negative, focus on the hurt, the criticism, the shaming, when you keep them in mind and you give yourself this command, even if it's subconsciously. So you need to ask yourself, you know, what is it that is going right? What is comforting? What is beautiful? What is kind? What is lovely? What is amazing? What is special? What is sacred in my environment? What really gives me a smile? What do I really love? What is comforting? And if you ask yourself that, you'll change your perspective 100%. Oh, I love those socks. I love that blanket. I love that pillow. I love that flower. I love that window. I love that windowsill. Um, I love that kitchen. I mean, you'll begin to then absorb and take in the positive. So I want you to focus in on today on really enhancing your reticular activating system and beginning to notice those things that give you joy, that give you peace that give you unconditional positive self-regard, where you just feel okay, you feel good, you feel safe, you feel a little bit of happiness. And if it's a little bit of happiness, that is what we're looking for because that is should be your chronic undergirding state, the foundation of you, and not all the chills, the fears, the paranoia that has been instilled, the negative you know, self-regard uh, that has been instilled or imprinted on you by all the words, the looks, the behaviors, all the senses of that negativity, which you have absorbed like a sponge. You need to squeeze it out. You need to, you know, it's time to wring out the washcloth. It's time to wring out the sponge that has absorbed all this negativity and squeeze it out. And stop looking for more reasons 
why this is so. Begin to take control over your reticular activating system and reinforce that and begin to really put in the effort so you can do that and then, you know, and begin to say, you know what, it's not that bad. I am pretty darn good. I am pretty darn great. I am pretty magnificent. Actually, there is a clean slate here. I see it now and I can begin to color that with the actual truth, the positive, which is genuine, which can't be taken from you. And then you'll begin to build up that experience and it will become unshakable. And furthermore, I want you to be able to share that, that being state, that positive being state with others, because the more you share, the more you validate and then you strengthen, strengthen the neuroplasticity, you strengthen the new neural connections within your mind, the new neurogenesis, and then the neurophysiology, which goes into your muscles, your heart, your organs, and helps propel you and helps you to move and feel and think and become. And then your identity gets set up on that positive. And then the other stuff, whatever it is that they say, you know, it doesn't matter. It's not true. You are magnificent. You, you know this. It's an internal no state, K-N-O-W. And then you are empowered. And once you keep firing, you keep igniting this, it will become unshakable. You'll become unstoppable. You'll be defining yourself and you'll have the internal validating system. And then as you share it with healthy others, it will become even more enhanced. You'll be enhancing your neuroplasticity. You'll be getting it stronger and stronger. It doesn't take an, happen overnight. It happens with time and it can begin for you now. This is your buddy, Peace and Harmony with you here today, and I hope that these videos do help. Please share and please subscribe for more great tools, videos, discussion, and support.